Morning. Morning. Really lovely to see you. Yes, indeed. I feel so privileged to get to take my mask off. Yeah, I know it. I'm so lucky up here. So welcome everyone. I'm Reverend Sue in service today and Charlie. Are, we're here if you need some prayer support after the after the service. Our speaker today is, is Reverend Andy, and we're looking forward to his message on It Might Be Otherwise, Imagination and Flow. And we're really, um, I love it when Reverend Andy has a chance to be with us and share his wisdom, because it really is life-changing, so I appreciate you being here very much. He's a busy man. I want to take a moment to uh, have you turn and say hello to our Facebook friends as Dave gets ready for that. Hello, everybody out there who's joining us. We are here. You are there. We are one. Yes. And it's, it's all a beautiful moment. He's moving the camera now, so better, if you want your wave to show up, there we go. All right. Here we go. Well, let's let that just go on and on and on and on. <laughs> Actually, that is just a fun part to feel in these times that we are indeed connected, always, always connected into this loving community. So I want to have you turn your cell phones off or silence them if you could as we begin uh, joining together here. And just a couple of uh, brief announcements that I want to make, but I want to honor that um, Dave is running the sound booth today, and uh, the young woman that is with him is my daughter, Lindy, and she's learning it and seeing if that's something she wants to do. Our Damien, as I wrote in an update to you, has decided to go off and, and explore the mystery of life, and he needs to release some of his commitments. So uh, we're sad to see him go, but we celebrate his journey and his life. So. If you are interested in joining the sound team, we are looking for other people that will help support that very important role, especially now in these times. So let us know if that's something that interests you as well. Uh, the uh, birthdays are also this month. Who has a November birthday? We Scorpios kind of rule. Oh, there's one. Happy birthday to you and to all of you at home that also have a birthday this month. We celebrate you. We'd sing to you, but I never know the exact key to sing in, and then I kind of ruin it for the rest of everybody else, but that's Shirley McQuiston who has her birthday that is celebrating here. So we applaud you. We applaud you. Yeah. Go. That's true, that's true. The um, couple of things I want to highlight that are going on this month, we're moving into November, and next week, next Sunday, for those of you that are interested, we, know, we all know and love Reverend Lynn Fritz, and she is a Karuk tribal descendant, and she is going to do a gathering here at the center at 1230 after services on November 8th, so it'll be 1230 to to park your car here, carpool an hour from here, and she's leading a Native American walking meditation. So if that is something that interests you, we need to contact her and let her know that you're interested and that you will be here. It is a $15 donation to, towards the, towards the uh, program. So you can text or call Lynn, and you can get that number by calling the center. I could say it to you now, but I don't know if you'll remember it. 530-243-8862. She'll appreciate that. Yeah. Or Lynn, product, Lynn Prod at sbcglobal.net is another way to reach out to her. And this whole month is dedicated to those darling little piggy banks for the endowment fund. So if you need a pig and you've got a lot of coin at home, there's a coin shortage. So if you want to instead just bring a check or... Dollar bills, those pigs are hungry. So you can do that as well. So there'll be a, a gathering, a formal gathering of those pigs on November 15th. And we'll be highlighting the, the beautiful, the whole format of the endowment fund, which supports so many projects at the center. So that's something to look forward to this month that is, that is fun. So that's all I'm going to sh share there. We're going to have Reverend 
Dr. Mary, come up and do our reading today. So, and then I'll sound the bell, do a prayer, and then we'll move right into to Andy's message. Mary, she looks so beautiful today. Good morning. I also want to let you know we did get in contact with the Reading uh, Police Association, and they are excited if we want to do uh, Blue Santa Bears again. And so if you're interested in su supporting that, uh, we'll say November 15th to December, November 13th to December 13th, uh, come and bring your bears, and they'll be very happy to get them. So the reading this morning is from Ernest Holmes in the Science of Mind text. The imagination is creative. A good psychological balance is struck when the will and the emotions are rightly poised. That is, when the intellect first decides what the emotions are to respond to. After the intellect has made that decision, then the imagination is called into play and the game of living commences. It is the office of the will to determine that which the imagination is to respond to. We should grow into the understanding that spirit responds to us and becomes more conscious of its presence within us. It is the very breath of our breath, the imagination of our word. And the sound of the bell for all of us here, for all of you at home watching, for those of you that listen to the podcast, that beautiful sound of the bell allows our, our own awakening to that imaginative center of divine wisdom to open and the channels begin to bring a deep calm. So as you listen, allow yourself in the physical being of your body to relax and to renew. You have come forward to listen to a message that will forever allow a shift to awaken in you a deeper understanding and a deeper love and connection to the divine. And for this, we are so grateful. This is the heart of this teaching. As we move through these different times, we recognize we are indeed one. And it is the imagination and the wisdom of the divine that is forever flowing that wakes us up to our true self. And from there, we serve. So I give thanks for the gathering, for your listening for the wisdom of Reverend Andy as he delivers his word to us today. We are grateful, so deeply grateful. And together we say, and so it is. My man, come on forward. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Good morning. It's always such a pleasure to be in this room and to be with you. And so I want to thanks. For, I want to um, express my gratitude for the invitation. Thank you. A writer that I discovered many, many years ago had an incredible impact on my life. Uh, her name is Diane Dreyer. And she's a, a Dallas scholar, and uh, she wrote a really uh, an amazing work, I think a real seminal work in spirituality, called The Tao of Inner Peace. And one of the things that she brings forward in that piece of writing 
is this really audacious idea that I think that as metaphysicians, I think it, it's a great representation of what people like Holmes are all about and all of our <clears throat> new thought ancestors and all of our, our, all of our really great um, metaphysical teachers. And she says basically that just because we inherit the skill set that we have um, in consciousness or emotionally or whatever doesn't mean that there isn't the possibility that we need to evolve past that. And that's, that's such an outrageous kind of statement, but it's just, I've, I've never found anything to be truer. Um, and basically, when I think about her work, I think about a uh, Serbian proverb that says, be humble, for we are made of the earth. Be noble, for we are also made of the stars. And so she, the reason that I, I think about this is because she's acknowledging the fact that because of our earthly journey, because we do have the ancestry and the evolutionary journey of being earth beings, we have to always remember that we are also beings of the stars and of potentiality. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Jurassic Park uh, movie series that comes out. And it's basically, it's, it's like these blockbuster films, you know, where they destroy as much stuff in two hours as they can. And, <clears throat> and we're on the edge of our seats the whole time. And one of the things that puts us on the edge of our seats is kind of on, in every single one of the movies, I don't know how many of the movies there are right now, but every single one of them has a scene like this, or maybe even two of them, where um, one of these incredible predators from that ancient world that, I mean, it's just like a, a living nightmare for us. I mean, just mouthful of teeth, huge, big, fast, um, just seems to be a, a, a devouring machine. And, you know, and we think of ourselves as being on the buffet of life when they come. <laughs> and it's just, you know, this, the, the archetype of the predator is something that we as human beings just that, that archetype is amazing because what that represents is to be confronted with something that is completely overpowering, takes away our freedom, takes away our life, and like there's no way out, right? And so there's that archetype, and so there's always a scene, but the movie always gives us a bit of information. Somewhere along the line, some scientist is going to say, now you got to remember, the only way they'll come after you is if you move, because... Their, their, their brains are constructed to go after movement. And if you can stay completely still, then you have a chance of making it, right? So there's always this scene where this huge head, you now the head itself probably weighs a ton or something, is coming down, eyes, evil looking eyes, big mouth, slobbering, and comes right up to the person. And there's a scientist over here that says, don't move. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you're sitting there, right? And, and it, this is just so, this is so terrifying as a human to watch this. And this comes in and it is smelling the person. And so you hear that smelling and maybe even like breathing. And we can assume it doesn't smell really good when they breathe, right? And it's like, you can't even cough. You can't even sneeze. You can't even, yeah, just, like, and there's this moment of terror. And the reason that we are terrified for, because of that is because there is something that is, um, that we have, it's a, it's a piece of consciousness that we have evolved, that our ancestry, ancestors evolved over tens of thousands of years, which we, we refer to as fight or flight. And so there's a part of us that wants to pull out our little big pin and stab it, or there's a part of us that wants to try and run away. But what's terrifying is we know the big pen isn't going to do anything and the running ain't going to do anything, and so I'm stuck. Now, what's really interesting is psychology will talk about fight or flight, but there's another place there that psychology reveals, and the best way we can put it is to freeze, to not either fight or flight, but to freeze. This is an area where I believe as we live our lives 
in terms of what we're confronted with that we would refer to as the place of imagination. Because what's our other option? Next Sunday is November 8th, and it's the two-year anniversary of the Paradise Fire. And just before I received a, a call or, or I, I got the idea that I would come up here and speak this Sunday, I had had another minister reach out to me and ask if I could be involved in something on the 8th, where I'm going to be involved in sort of a discussion-style talk with me and another minister, and they want to get my reflections on what metaphysical principles have become the most meaningful to me over the last two years? And what is it that I live my life by? And so for me, when I was, I was asked about this, the principles that have always been so meaningful to me, ever since I found religious science and metaphysics, has been possibility and potentiality. And what I mean by that is, and I'm, I'm sure we all have our own frame of reference for this, is that no matter where I am, there is a place of possibility and potentiality. I love that. I love that transformational notion. And I also think about um, how it has to have its place. Because very often when someone has experienced a tragedy or a longing or a loss of some kind, it's not a good idea to show up at the funeral and go to the loved ones and say, by the way, there's possibility of potentiality here. That's not a good idea because they're in that grieving place. But once we allow ourselves to move through that, then I love the idea of possibility and potentiality. And so, I found, it was really interesting because I found that when I was approached by another minister about what they want me to do next week, I felt like I woke up the next morning and one of those predators was right here, smelling me up and down. And I found myself in that, in that place of uh, fight or flight. I kind of wanted to call back and say I didn't want to do it. I kind of didn't like the feelings that were coming up in me that I didn't think were hanging around much anymore. That was the flight part of me. I'm not sure what the fight part of me was. But I came into that place of, of being frozen. And I found myself grabbing a hold of another um, truth that has come to mean so much to me over the last two years. <clears throat> a truth that I was turned on to many years ago from the native traditions and the earthen traditions called shape-shifting. And I believe that the idea of shape-shifting, if you, if you listen to the reading this morning from Holmes, when he talks about when we are aligned, and when our psychology is aligned, and when we come into our breath, what, is the East, what do the Eastern traditions say? Let's come into our breath, let's come into our core. <clears throat> All you yoga people, what's it say? You know, I can go, I can be downward dog, I can be a warrior, I can be a tree, I can be a waterfall, I can be all kinds of things, but then come back to the core, come back to the core. And I can't do any of those unless my core is strong. So, I come into that place. I come into that place of breath, of space. And that's where my imagination takes over. Um, there is a, a writer by the name of Dan Millman who, uh, I'm sorry, uh, we all know about Dan Millman, okay. Um, I'm trying to, uh, here we go. There's a, a, a writer by the name of Jonathan Hammond who wrote a book, who has written a book called The Shaman's Mind, who I am I'm reading right now, and I re I'm reading it for the second time, and I really enjoy it. And he takes, he takes the idea of the demigod, the demigod on, 
And the demigod comes to us from Greek and, and Roman ideas originally, and it comes down through the ages, and it kind of lives in our Western sensibilities. And the demigod is someone who, in the, de the, the official definition of a demigod, is a being with partial or lesser divine status, such as a minor deity, the offspring of a god or a mortal, or a mortal raised by divine rank. Now that's the definition. And um, Jonathan Hammond brings it into the idea of shapeshifting. Now in the native traditions, the shapeshifter is somebody who uh, is, is generally an animal or another being. In some Native American traditions, especially in the, in the Northwest, it is the raven, sometimes it's the coyote, sometimes it's other beings. And what Jonathan Hammond says is the demigod, demigods are audacious and filled with curiosity, capable of shape-shifting and ability to inhabit a host of other forms to accomplish marvelous and extraordinary feats. So the predator comes, I am still, I am in my place of being frozen, I'm in my place where my imagination comes, my creativity comes forward. And in that moment, I believe that we are called to engage in shape-shifting. Because when I was able to settle my nerves enough after, being, after having been asked to do this, I thought about it for a while. And I thought about the idea was, how have I been able to turn towards possibility and potentiality is that the minute that that event happened two years ago, and once I moved past my shock, which I was in for probably a number of days, staying with relatives, you know, trying to go to work, trying to get groceries, trying to figure something out, trying to go in a different direction, but to be in shock, I really don't remember those days very well. It's interesting, Judy and I talk about that, and we don't remember the first week or so you know, like, how did we get those clothes? Did, did you go to Walmart or, you know, how did we get the toothpaste? Where did, you know, what happened? Where did you go? What, you know, we don't remember that. So we came into that place of being frozen. And then at that point, I had to go into a different direction. I had to be able to practice non-attachment with who I was, where I lived, what my stuff was, and I had to be willing to open up to a different incarnation. I had to begin to drop my titles from uh, as simple as I'm a resident of paradise. I had lived in that town for a really long time. You know, where do you live? Paradise. I no longer had that title. Where do you live? I don't know. That's a new title. So I began to shift my sensibility into the idea that for a while my home became my car and my backpack. And I, my, home, my car was a place that when I would get off work and before I would start the business of all the stuff I had to do to find a camping trailer and find a place to put it and get us moved and do the insurance stuff and all that other stuff, my car became that place where I'm sure like all of us, and this is true of me today, you know, our home is that place where we kind of come in after the day, we drop our keys, we sit down, we breathe, we kick off our shoes and we take a breath and oh my God, I'm home. That became my car. My, my home base in terms of a couple of books I scrounged together and my business and my work became my backpack. And um, Judy and I went into a situation where we, we began to, it became a mantra for us that when our emotions would well up during that time, we would look at each other and one of us would say, we are, we are in the process of practicing non-attachment. And sometimes we would laugh about that and sometimes we'd want to slap each other about that, but that's where we were. And then I became a citizen of Los Molinas, which was a different shape-shifting. I went there, got into a mobile home park with a little camping trailer. I got a P.O. box there, changed everything around. I became, where do you live? Well, I live in Los Molinas. What's your address? I, I'm not sure what it is. I can tell you my P.O. box. I had to be okay with that. 
I shapeshifted into a place of being adrift and finding a home in being adrift. Again, with the practices of non-attachment. Coming into the space where something can happen. Because I didn't have the luxury of, of fight or flight. I didn't know what to fight, and I wasn't going to flight. And so I had to come into a place where I had to shift myself. And then there was something else that happened during that time, very, br very briefly after it happened, was I had to take stock. I really had to take stock of my life. There's, there's nothing that can get us to take stock more than a predator here sniffing us. We start taking stock on what's really important, right? And I began to take stock. And what I realized, and this was a, a very difficult one for me, was I had to, what I realized was that one of the predators who had been in my face for a while was my own ego. And I'll tell you why, because for me, and this has nothing to do with anybody else who has gone through any kind of a disaster, you know, hurricanes, fires, floods, whatever it is. This is for Andy. What I came to realize in that moment of being frozen was that there was another shape-shifting thing that I had to do. Because I realized that for the last couple years before that, I had become very unhappy in being the pastor of a center at that time. Doesn't mean forever, but at that time. And when I, whenever that realization was come up for me, which was a predator that came to me before the fire ever happened, I would push it away. I would, I would um, practice flight. I would suppress it. I wouldn't look at it. I wouldn't process it. I wouldn't think about it. And suddenly, the fire was so devastating and overwhelming to me that the thought of going on as the, the lead minister of a center was untenable. I could not handle it. Now, you ask about my ego. See, the thing was, is that I had developed an identity that I really wasn't aware I had until I took a good close look at it. And that was, I was someone who went through ministerial training and then became the, the, the pastor of a center. I never did staff ministry. I never did any of that stuff that a lot of people do. I went right into it. And I, my ego got off on that, to be quite honest with you. I would run into people that I, I took my, my same years of ministry training and they'd be talking about things you know, in their centers, or they'd be complaining about things, or the ministers they were working for and stuff, and, and, and they, would, they would talk to me, and i said, well, you know, you might have a different perspective if you were the pastor of your center. You know, I didn't have the luxury of being a staff minister. And I, I realized I began to wear that as some identity that I'm not sure if I was really, you know, first of all, prepared for, and secondly, was that really my highest calling at that particular time? And so over time, you know, I, I think I did a pretty good job over time, in this, and I love being with the center, but in the last two years I was there, there was something breaking loose in me. Was I really happy? Was I really content? Had a lot of problems sleeping. You know, I was irritable. I was impatient. I kept doing this work. I wanted to be graceful. I wanted to be patient. I wanted to be all those things, but, but something kept creeping up, and that predator would come in. And when I, when it, if it ever crossed my mind that maybe I should make a change in my life, then I would run away from it. I never sat with it. I never processed it. I never, I, I never even entertained or imagined anything else. So I had this incredible conversation on a telephone after the fire, and I was in a laundromat somewhere on a Friday night. Noisy, lots of people, all kinds of paradise people. I mean, for a while in Chico, laundromats on Friday nights were just full of paradise people. If you wanted to find somebody from paradise, go to a laundromat. We were all there. And so I was in the laundromat, and I got a phone call from Dr. Edward over at Santa Rosa, who's now the head of CSL. And he got my number somehow, my cell phone number, and called and reached out to me. And it was really an amazing conversation. And he was 
present for me and trying to talk me through it. And, and, and I ended up talking through, I, we talked like for two hours this laundromat. I mean, my clothes, my poor clothes were just getting dried to death, you know. And I'm just talking, talking, and I, I had trouble hearing him sometime. And I, and I thought that I was showing up the way I should. I was humble and I was noble and I was spiritual and I was, I was you know, I was doing, again, my, you know, I wanted, my ego was just really taking over and I, I wanted to show up in principle and all that stuff. But Dr. Edward is a really smart individual and he's a very discerning individual and has incredible intuition. And all of a sudden he said to me, he said, Andy, if you if you ever thought that you might want to leave that center, it would be okay. Uh, wh what are you talking about? I, of course not. That, that would be horrible if I did that. I, you know, I, I can't shape shift like that. I mean, I have to, you know, I, I can't do that. And, and I resisted. And, you know, and, and Dr. Edward is, if you know him, he's a very quiet person. And he gives people a lot of space. And I went on and on. He listened, he listened, he listened, he listened. He came back on, he just said the same thing. If you ever thought you would want to leave, it would be okay. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks, this is your life. I'm in a laundromat, you know, I got a cell phone, it's noisy, paradise people, and I'm, I, and I'm just doing everything to hold back from just dropping into sobbing on the floor, ugly crying, because he said something that was the truth. You need to shift. You need to shape shift, buddy. You need to move into a different incarnation. See, this is the deal. What's the bottom line of all this? I believe, and what I think Jonathan Hammond is saying, and what I think Diane, what's her name, Diane Dwyer. Hold on a minute, Diane Dreyer. What she is saying is. We have to be, we have to come into a sense of oneness with the predator. A sense of oneness where we are. In order to allow our imagination and our creativity to take over. And to move into something else. There's a story from the Pacific Northwest native people who talks about the raven and they say that the raven for them is the demigod. The raven is the shapeshifter. And there's this story, and of course all these mythologies and everything are so dramatic. They're like the Old Testament. They're like any religion. The, the mythologies are dramatic. They're like a great big godfather film and, and with dinosaurs. I mean, just really drama. And we have to, we have to figure out what the, what, what the, what the, what the, what the, what the underlying you know, message is. And so, once upon a time on a beach, there was this great clam that appeared on the beach and all the other creatures were freaked out because this clam was so huge and it was making some kind of noise in there and it, everyone was afraid and they were running away. They said Raven came down and Raven was a curious creature. Raven was the demigod. Raven was the shapeshifter. And hey, what's, I wonder what's going on here. So he, he lands on the clam and he's listening to it. And when the, when the the natives of the Pacific Northwest, they act this out, you know, and they have the, they have the, the great cedar masks on, and they, act, they, have the, they have the mannerisms of the raven, and the raven cocks its head and listens. What's going on here? And his mouth goes open. I, I, I can't imagine what's going on here. He jumps on the sand, and he, he perceives the clam, and he looks at the clam. He's in, 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 in the presence of the clam. All the other creatures, Raven, what are you doing? Oh my God, it's so scary. It's making noise. I've never seen a clam that big. Get out of there. Run for your life. Raven is just there for a while. So then he jumps on top and his curiosity gets the best of him. And so he takes his great beak and he tries to pry it open. And he pries and pries and pries. And finally it pops open. And human beings begin to come out of the clamshell. It's their story of creation. And so, the creation of human beings. So Raven is there for a while, and he's kind of freaked out by these human beings, but he says, hmm, I don't know. I don't know if I can trust him or not. I don't know if I'm safe. So he jumps down the sand, and he shapeshifts into a human being, just to kind of hang out with them, see what they're like. And the story goes, he hangs out for a while, and he becomes bored. 
And so he goes back and becomes a raven and flies away. Audacious, curious, at one with the challenge. Religious science has a teaching of denying the condition. And I believe, in my humble opinion, especially from what the fire has taught me, was that before I could shape shift into another manifestation or another way of dealing with things or to become somebody else, I had to understand what the challenge was. Because the challenge is a gift to show us something greater about ourselves. To come into that oneness. Dan Millman talks about, um, he talks about the, the egret, which is a, a, a beautiful bird that's used a lot in Eastern traditions. And he said, we look at the egret and it, it's standing in a pool of water, standing along the river, and, uh, and it's so graceful. And a lot of us would just like to live life like an egret, like you are just so graceful. I just want to be graceful like you. So Dan Millman poses a question. Are we willing to feel what the egret feels? You know, we're taken in by the beauty of the egret, but are we willing to feel? In the midst of everyday life, for it has found a way to remain calm, balanced, and graceful. Now, it's interesting because if we look at what water represents, water represents life. Water is source. It is caring. It is nurturing. It is loving. It is the, the womb of life. It is home. But it can also be swift and treacherous and has the ability to take away life as well. And so the egret stands in the midst of all that turmoil in a graceful way. And Dan Millman says, because it finds its balance. He goes on to say, once we know what true balance feels like, we'll begin to notice what's out of balance. In my case, I couldn't deal with that whole ministerial thing because I was out of balance. The fire was a great balancing act. Because I was releasing, I was letting go, I was practicing non-attachment. And Reverend Edward gave me the permission to practice non-attachment. He says the law of balance is not just a philosophy, but a way of life through practice and application. So I want to tell you a really quick story. I know I'm really pushing the time here. I, I met a woman years ago, and she told me a story, and it was a professional relationship. Um, I was working with her as a counselor, and she was dealing with some really severe kinds of addiction issues. And we were talking one day, and in, when, you, when you deal with addiction issues, you go to what psychology talks about, the core issues, you know, the, the underlying things that may cause us to get into fight or flight, basically. And so her whole life was about flight, and she was using uh, alcohol to do that with. And in the course of um, her story, though, she ended up teaching me an incredible lesson about shape-shifting. She grew up in a home where both her parents struggled with alcoholism, and she, it was she and her sister. And she and her sister kind of grew up in what seemed to be like a minefield, you know, or a battlefield, and kind of, you know, they kind of kept low profile. Uh, it, according to her, it was not a home, if you were to walk into it, it was not chaotic at all. In fact, everything was very pristine. Everything was very put together. But she said everything below the surface was we did not deal with anything. And she and I had a running joke. She said, man, we swept so much stuff under the carpet, sometimes you would trip going through the front room. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it was like there was dead bodies under that carpet, you know? We didn't deal with anything. And so um, her father was a very angry man who had an engineering background, and he loved to work with things. But he was so successful in his company, they moved him up into management. And that's, that's the position he was in when he was raising his family, and he hated it, but he wouldn't let it go. And she said he just hated his life, and, and, and he, he drank to deal with that, and then his mom tended to drink to deal with him. 
And her mom passed away many, many years ago when she just kind of came into adulthood. She was 18 or 20 years old. She and her sister were trying to deal with that. And so they were left with mom, left with dad, who was not, you know, easy to deal with. And, and now he was even more upset because his wife passed away and all that. So she was telling me that her dad um, at one point developed uh, some health issues. He was getting older and he was alone and uh, she lived in the same town and so she would go see him. And I said, wow, I said, tell me about what it was like to go see your dad, you know, when he was really needing help and not doing very well. What was that like? And she said, well, I, f I found a way to do it. And I said, what do you mean by that? And she said, I, um, I developed something I call my little shares. I said, what do you, what do you mean? She said, well, my dad is, you know, he's not, he's not much of a communicator. And she said, so I would go over to his house, and he, and he either liked to watch TV or be on the computer, but, he, you know, but she wanted to check on him, and she cared about him. And she said there was no way that they could talk about anything that was real. And she said, my dad and I, we both loved rocks. And so during the week, she, she'd go over there about a couple times a week, and she goes, I'd spend my whole time everywhere I went, like, you know, if there was some landscaping or something, I'd be looking around for a little rock, any kind of little rock that looks interesting, the color, the shape, the minerals, everything. She goes, I would come up with a couple of them, and I would go over there, and we would both talk about these rocks. She said my dad loved engineering, so she was at a yard sale one time, and someone was selling an old uh, uh, film projector for like five bucks, and she bought it, took it over there, and they kind of tore it apart together and talked about the way it worked. She said... I knew that my dad was not capable of talking about anything meaningful, but I loved my dad. I wanted to be with him. I wanted his time with me to be good too. So I would, like, I would look for anything that could give us an hour together. And she called him her little shares. I was blown away by that. You wanna talk about shape shifting? Oh my God. To be able to step into that place of pure love. Pure love. Wow. That's one of the most creative things I've ever heard in my life. I love you, Dad. I just want to be here. I know you're not capable, so we don't have to fight or flight. What's she going to do, fight him or run away from him? She wanted to be with him. In the reading you heard this morning, Holmes talks about it becomes our breath. It becomes our breath. Which way shall I go? That will open us up to possibility and potentiality. The woman I'm talking about was able to create the field of possibility and potentiality by the way she approached her father because she understood him. All right. So, I am preparing for next Sunday, and I am so grateful for this teaching, and I'm grateful for the idea of being a shapeshifter. So next uh, Sunday, I'm going to fly in somewhere as the raven, and I'm going to do my thing. So, all right. so I'd, I'd uh, appreciate if you join me in a consciousness of prayer. Oh, so as we come together in this glorious place with these beautiful people, and we speak to all the beautiful people who are out there, I can't imagine all the devices right now, the, the phones, the computers, the nooks, the books, the pads, the screens, that have become a sanctuary throughout this community and beyond. We all come together in consciousness. We all hold the high watch for each other and we all, uh, we all honor that shape-shifting quality that we each have. We honor that space in which imagination and creativity take over as our birthright. And where love is expressed and healing is uncovered and a larger sense of ourselves comes through. I am so grateful for that. And in my gratitude for this, I let my word go, knowing that it's so, and so it is.
Thank you. Wow. I love all, all of the things that you had to share today. And if um, some of you uh, know that we do a, a midweek call on Wednesdays, and that's a really good time for you to check in if you want an invitation to that Zoom call, just to kind of talk and share your reflections on some of the powerful things that, that Reverend Andy shared with us today. That's a nice time to, to have that social time that we're not allowed to do right now. But Andy, so much. So much heart, and so much truth, so much honesty. So thank you for the courage to share that with all of us. It makes a difference, that genuineness. So um, this is the time that we would just remind ourselves of the abundance that's ever flowing, the prosperity that's flowing and supporting us so that we can remain open and prosperous. And so we invite your gifts on the baskets as you, as you exit and uh, continue to uh, feel the gratitude always for the attitude with which you offer your, your gifts to the center to keep us keep us grow, growing and glowing, I should say. So uh, we're going to move into the closing part of our, our uh, service. If you have any questions, Carol Moreland is our board member, and she can also uh, track down the phone number of Lynn if you wanted to grab that. And if you needed a piggy, she could help with that as well. The bookstore is open, and if you want to browse that, that's that opportunity as well. So, what do we have for our closing music? All right. <laughs> Sorry. I just, my ears for mask talking isn't very good. But let's, let's enjoy this Come moment together. Down my bird hill, down by the riverside, down by the riverside. Down by the riverside, I'm gonna lay down my burden. Down by the riverside, down by the riverside. I ain't gonna study war no more, ain't gonna study war no more, ain't gonna study war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more, ain't gonna study war no more, ain't gonna study war no more. I'm gonna give up my judgments Down by the riverside Down by the riverside Down by the riverside I'm gonna give up my judgments Down by the riverside Down by the riverside I ain't gonna study war no more 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 Ain't gonna study war no more. Ain't gonna study war no more. Ain't gonna study war no more. I'm gonna walk in forgiveness down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. I'm gonna walk in forgiveness down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. I ain't gonna study war no more, ain't gonna study war no more, ain't gonna study war, ain't gonna study war no more, ain't gonna study war no more, ain't gonna study war no more, ain't gonna study war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more, ain't gonna study war no more, ain't gonna study war, ain't gonna study war no more. 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 Yay! <laughs> oh gosh, that takes me back to some great times. Uh, I think some of the hippies in here are going, oh yeah. Oh yeah, where is my tie-dye? Oh yeah. So have a, have a blessed day on this beautiful, gosh, 
a warm day for November. We, we know that we're also praying for, for rain to, to come our way and wash our land, but let's enjoy the beauty of what is in the present moment. So have a beautiful one, everyone. Thank you for being here today.